knew what a hobbit was. And so that's what he wrote. He said, imagine a hobbit hole. <laughs> and really, just from his imagination, he invented this thing called a hobbit. And so uh, he continued to write. He wrote this book about the Fellowship of the Ring. And now it's become a big movie, you know, and then, they, of course, the second book then is The Two Towers. Then the last uh, book is The uh, Lord of the Rings. Huh? Return of, Return of the King, you're right. But this is, this is the, this fantasy that he wrote, and, and when did he die? Like 1964, I think, is when he died. And even then, he still wasn't done with everything, but of course they got a hold of his papers and books and finished printed, printing them. Mm -hmm. But Tolkien, he, he, so he wrote this sword and sorcery fairy tale type stuff. But in it, and the, see, I had to read it back in the 70s. When I graduated from high school, I ended up reading it because I could see all the college kids were into this stuff, into these, this series, these three books. And De, uh, Joy's brother, who'd been to Vietnam and back, he had them, so I got his collection and read them. And right away, being a Bible believer already then, I'm seeing all these Bible-believing words. For instance, uh, in this fellowship, there's a wizard, Gandalf the Grey. And he's in the, this mount. They're in this mountain. The, the fellowship is. There's these nine, you know. There's these nine people that make up this fellowship. You know, there's four dwarf. There's, I mean, there's one dwarf. There's four hobbits. There's a couple men that are princes and stuff. And uh, of these nine people, uh, what it is is the the, the, the task is to take this ring. This ring was a ring of power forged at Mordor in this big volcanic you know lava and all that and they made this ring. Rings were given throughout the world to different kings and leaders but then this evil dark lord had one ring that could rule all of them. And through this evil ring that has inner evil in it, he could, and he at one time was out to control the world, and the men had to fight against him, and in the end, the ring got lost. And a little hobbit found the ring, and it caused the ring, caused him to be a murderer, murdered his own brother first thing, uh, to get it, and uh, called him to turn into a golem. And Gollum is a Scottish word for ghost. So right away you're starting to see these old words that mean something else and it's kind of is, is telling you things that the Bible tells you about. Mm -hmm. And so when Tolkien writes a story, he's stealing all these Bible truths and putting them in his story. And here these kids are. They're reading this stuff. You know, if we, re if we turn over here to in our Bibles, to the book of Numbers even, we're reading so-and-so, the brother of so-and-so, the father of so-and-so, so-and-so, so We go, oh, man, ain't that a born part of the Bible? And yet that's, a, that's in this guy's fairy tales. And the, and the college kids are reading it up. So I said, I got to read this to find out what, what's going on. <laughs> so I can be a witness to him. And I did, because I could learn right away. You know, I could see the language, and I, I even started a track. I wrote a track about it, because... Because who, who can't miss? Here's Gandalf the Grey. He's the wizard leading them, and he has some powers, you know. And yet he's protecting all of them. He's fighting the Bolrog by himself in the middle of this mountain. Now, what's the name of the mountain? Moriah. Can you miss that? Genesis 22? When Abraham offered his son, son at Mount Moriah, and Mount Moriah is where Jesus will be crucified, Jesus will be buried in Moriah, and Jesus will come out of Moriah, later to be called Calvary. All the same mountain. Same mountain where they build the temple. So I'm seeing now this guy, man, this guy's just stealing Bible, stealing Bible, and making his own story up. <laughs> and yet he had a purpose, because both of them, both C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, volunteered to go into World War I and fought the fight. And their shock and dismay to be in France and look out and not see a single blade of grass, but see nothing but dust, and dirt and men standing, sitting, laying, nothing but dead men all over the fields. 
This is terrible. And see the result of war and men dying. It's not an easy picture. Real life isn't an easy picture. It's tough. It's fight, fight, fight. It's survival of the fittest. Tough. So God bless uh, these two men. So Tolkien wrote this book, and he's got it. So here's here's Strider. Now Strider's just a guy riding a horse. Try he's like a he's like a uh, policeman, but he just volunteers to help people. He you know, always just trying to help people. Whoever needs help, he's just out there riding his horse. He's just trying to help. He's a he's a ranger they call him. But no, this is Aragon, the son of Arathon, heir of Elendil. What do you mean? See, you know, it's like in the land of Uz, there was a man named Job. You know, you know. You know, Parbar, east of Parbar, fort of the causeway. You know, those verses are in the Bible, and and he's got verses like that. But yet, it's somehow you know. And then as that guy, as he's using his power and fighting this giant monster from the deep, this Bolrog, and suddenly the the. Uh, Bridge gives way, and they both go falling into this bottomless pit, and they and everybody, oh no, you know. Now the eight are all crying; they're going to miss Gandalf because boy, he was the brains of the outfit, and he's gone. But because somehow that ring ended up in Frodo's hands, and Frodo has to take it all the way to the mountain of doom and throw it back in where it came from. And yet it's evil in itself, and even if it's, it's getting heavier and heavier, he's got a chain around his neck. And it's tempting him. Every now and then he slips his finger, finger in it and goes invisible. But then the dark and evil people can find him quicker now. It's a frustration for him. So here they fall away. And, oh, and so now they know well, we got to keep fighting the evil and fighting the bad because there's evil forces arising. And they know somehow the ring has been found and they're going to try to get it back and then they can control the whole Middle Earth again. And as they're fighting and struggling, uh, suddenly then one day when they needed some help, here out of nowhere comes Gandalf, but he's not Gandalf the Grey no more. He's Gandalf the White. And he's got more powers than he ever had before now. Wait a minute, that's Jesus. See, he would, When they see him the next time, he's a glorified Christ. He's done fought the devil and went to hell for us, but now here he is. Coming back as a glorified Christ to help us and save us, amen? amen. And it's so interesting, you know, you got eagles, you got him catching a little yeah. butterfly and talking to it, and then it goes and gets an eagle to come after him and carry him away. It's so cool. It's got cool little stories throughout it. <laughs> now, when C.S. Lewis, when he became a Christian now, he starts writing, and they both write fairy tales. And the reason is because when they were little boys, there was a Scottish minister by the name of George MacDonald. And I was with my family in Toledo one day, and I was at Kroger, and they had a little book section, you know, and they usually have some religious books. And there it said, hey, check out this little book of George MacDonald. He's a Congregationalist minister in Scotland back here in the 18, you know, 60s, 70s. And so here he wrote these fairy tales. Fairy tales? Teaching you Bible truth. And so I get the one, you know, it's like, it's, it's the princess and the hobgoblins or Curdie and the hobgoblins, something like that. And it's about this princess, you know, and there's this little boy her age she meets and her, his daddy's a miner. And, and they're in the, somehow or another, she's in this, mine and Curtis leading her out of the mine and he's saying now don't be afraid of the hobgoblins because if you're afraid they can sense your fear and they'll capitalize on your fear and so don't be afraid of them and then she ends up going to this house and it's uh, like an enchanted house and since she's a princess then the queen actually the queen mother is in this house up in the attic and I don't know if she's spinning on it or something but so she goes in this house because there's a spider web on the banister of the stairs, and as long as she can keep her finger on that spider web and go up the stairs, then she ends up finding her 
sort of like her guardian angel grandmother up there, and she's telling her about life and things and not, how not to be afraid and look. Because, again, we all have, you know, somebody in heaven praying for us, so to speak. And you go, whoa, this is where I, I oh, I got it. So, so of course, C.S. Lewis and Tolkien are going to write these fairy tales and pack them full of all kinds of stuff. Because they remember reading this stuff of George McDonald, George McDonald uh, who was a Scottish minister. And it all means something else. But now C.S. Lewis goes whole hog and writes seven whole fairy tale books about Aslan in the land of Narnia. Right. And some of you may have seen the movie when it came out, The, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Because now, what is that about? Well, that's about these kids in, the, in England during the World War, Second World War, they would take all the kids and send them out in the country. And if a rich man had a big rich manor, these kids from the city are out in the country now, bored to tears, you know, it's raining most of the time in England, you know. So they got this big castle of a house, and so they're just playing hide and seek. You know, kids are going to do what they got to do. So the kid goes into a wardrobe. There's a big wooden wardrobe there. So one of the kids hiding. So she goes into this wardrobe and she starts pushing the clothes out of the way. He keeps going deeper and deeper in. Next thing she knows, she pushes a little more. And she feels something at her feet. And she looks out, and she's in the land of Narnia, and and it's snow, and it's cold, and there's a single lamp post lit up out here in the middle of the woods, and then there's Timnus there. There's that guy that's a, a half goat, half man. And he's talking to her, and she tell, she says, well, where am I? She, he said, well, this is the land of Narnia. And he calls her, you know, the daughter of Eve, and then later on her brother and sisters come in there, and he calls them the you know, sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. And it's a big deal that, it, that all of a sudden they're being visited here by, these, uh, by this little family. And so she gets to talk to a porcupine. It's a land where all the animals talk. But it's cold all the time. It's, it's, it's always cold cold in winter, but it's never Christmas. Because there's a witch that runs the place. And that witch is an evil person. And when Aslan, the lion of the tribe of Judah, comes, this wonderful lion that's the personification of Christ, uh, she, she's allowed because one of, her, one of Lucy's little brothers uh, did the wrong thing and ate some of the princess's cakes and he fell under her spell and now he's miserable. He's dying, to be honest, he's dying. And, uh, but he's her slave and so Aslan, to win him back from the witch, he allows the witch and all her hobgoblins to come and kill him and he's slaughtered on a table of stone and when they kill him, the stone table is broken showing you the law and how Christ came to fulfill the law and he died for us but after three days and nights <laughs> good news Aslan is alive and boy is he mad <laughs> and so The boys were able to tap in on something in their writings, and that word is the fellowship of not the ring, but the king. Amen? Right. There is a fellowship we have. We're different people, too. We're, some of us are little dwarves. Some of us are big, tall, skinny men and so forth and so on. Some of us are hobbits, <laughs> like to go around barefoot all the time. Yeah. and this is one of the scenes where they're going into the land of the king and so what would they have of course there's a big king here and his son the prince and they're warning you don't go any further there's a giant waterfall just a little ways down the way and you're going to die and this is and this is when as you see here's the fellowship going into this land of the kings and there are three little canoes I mean it's an awesome task it's daunting what they have to do but they're going to do it because if they don't, it's the end of everything. Mm -hmm. And everything will be in darkness. And so that's a part of the struggle in life. We're fighting and struggling. But thank God we can have a fellowship and, joy and enjoy one another's service and company. The Bible speaks of fellowship in the Bible 17 times in 16 verses. Now the word ring is in the Bible 11 times out of 10 verses. But the word king 
is in the Bible 2,256 times, amen, in only 1,756 verses. So I got to thinking today how First Peter 2.17 says, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And I think it's very much a good thing to say that when we think of fellowship, we think of this brotherhood that we have, thanks to Jesus, because what is a fellowship? It's two fellows in a ship. It's, it's at least two fellows in the ship. Well, what are they doing? Well, they're going to be close together. There's nothing much to do outside in the water. So you're in this ship and you're headed to the same place together. And that's the thing. We're all headed for heaven. Amen. We're on the old ship of Zion. We're headed for heaven. So we can have some fellowship as we are working together uh, for the king. And Christ is the king. Acts 17.7 7 says, Whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And this is, the, what the, this is what our world hates about us. We just can't talk enough about Jesus. Amen. But Jesus is what we talk about because we love him, and we have a fellowship as we're headed for heaven together on the old ship of Zion and in his, his church. So I'm going to talk about that. I begin to think of how these fellows are going to, some are going to die in the process. Many will lose their friends. They'll see them die. They'll see them disappoint them. And that's a part of life. The Bible says faithful are the wounds of a friend. If you have a real good friend, you choose to be their friend. It's not because they always deserve it, but because you choose to be their friend. Because sometimes they hurt you. That's a part of it. And it's okay. <laughs> Because we're still brothers in the Lord and brothers and sisters in the Lord. Amen. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians. First of all, we have a separated fellowship. Mm -hmm. We have a separated fellowship. Here's how Paul put it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. Mm -hmm. Amen. God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship yes. amen of his son Jesus Christ our Lord amen. Amen. amen so we're in fellowship because of Jesus Jesus is our elder brother he shed his blood so that we could be in God's family and everything God has someday we're going to have because of Jesus we're not worth it we're not worthy but praise God for our elder brother Jesus who won it for us. Then Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 20, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with Devil. So we don't do what they do. We don't celebrate what they celebrate. We have different things. Because ours is a separated fellowship that he's called us to. We're not interested in the things that they Catholic, the Catholic Church and all them have. for Because they're, they're serving devils. They're not serving the Lord. They live for one Mary. They make a God of Mary. Someone they call Mary. And so Paul deals with these subjects. Look at 2 Corinthians. What do we see here? In 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Of course unbelievers don't have the same God. They don't have the same appetites. They don't have the same love. Right. They don't have a brotherhood like we have. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? I don't want to be a part of a church that's linked to the state. The state is full of infidels. 
people that are working against God and against Christ. Never mind all the atheists. <laughs> Amen? So what part had he that believeth, that's the church, with an infidel? That's the state. And yet we're at a day where it's common. Many churches are linked to the state. Sad, isn't it? Because the state is their business partner. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4. Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Now, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 talk about how that when we're over here praying for the people of the Philippines today, they're sleeping. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. But when we go to sleep tonight, the 100 churches that are Anabaptists in the islands of the Philippines and the 100 churches that are Baptists throughout the islands of the Philippines that Brother Bornalis had established out of his church. They're praying for us. When we're asleep, they're praying for us. Amen. See, it's a mutual fellowship. Right. And we've supported them and they're supporting us. And we're supporting, they're supporting us and we're supporting them. Mm -hmm. And so it's right that there is even an exchange of money that we want to have a part in their lives and in their ministering and receiving the things of God and teaching yeah. things. Mm -hmm. And so... We're in this fellowship together. Then, secondly, it's a successionist fellowship. Now, let's go on to Galatians. That's Corinthians, Galatians. Look at this wonderful verse that reminds us that, yes, we have this fellowship of the Lord. And it's rightfully, now see, once upon a time, there was this dude, the law and the prophets were until John, John the Baptist. Then John started baptizing people, and then here comes Jesus. And John baptized Jesus. So John was a Baptist. He wasn't a Methodist or a Lutheran. And then we got Jesus the Baptist. And all the way to today, there's been Baptist churches. And so we have a successionist fellowship. People believe just like we believe, love the same Lord, have the same book. And it's wonderful that because they believed and loved the Lord, and sent missionaries out and ministers and we're still doing it today and it goes way back now someone has said are you a Baptist brighter no I'm not a Baptist brighter but I am a part of the bride because the Bible says that the church is the bride of Christ amen so I don't mind the term too much And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, received the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me the, and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. Right. See, that's the brotherhood. That's what I'm talking about. That we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So we came to some understanding. They're going to primarily make their ministry to Jews, whereas we were just going to go to anybody but a Jew and make sure they get the gospel too. Mm -hmm. But it's the same Jesus and it's the same... Blood of Jesus that will save anybody. Amen. So there they are, all nine of them, in a fellowship. And yet they won't always get to be together. They're going to have to split up. Boromir is going to be tempted to steal a ring for himself. He'll admit it just as he's dying. Because then the enemy attacks and there's all these orcs to kill. So they get busy sidetracked. And then next thing you know, he's dead. Sad, isn't it? Sad. These are friends. They love them. They're friends. They've been buddies. You know, they've been sharing food together and, and, and getting along together. And now they're gone. Somebody's gone. It's sad. But we're going to be with them longer than we're without them. Amen. I'm looking forward to seeing Brother Danny in heaven. Thirdly, it's a sound, a loud fellowship. We can't shut up about it. we got to tell everybody. Amen. Amen. Now this is where <laughs> Gandalf the Gray is fighting the Borog. And he's down in the depths of Mount Moriah. Taking him on. I mean, this is a monstrous, devilish, fiery serpent monster. And in the end, he'll be defeated. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 9. Amen. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 9. So whereas J.R.R. Tolkien just uses the right and wrong to show life and 
how we have to work together sometimes and keep fighting for good and defeat evil. Uh, C.S. Lewis went ahead and just personified Jesus as a lion in this land of Narnia and uh, the voyages of, of course, Reap a Cheap and the different things. And they're great stories for your children and grandchildren because there's a lot of direct parallels to the scriptures and Jesus in them. Well, in Ephesians 3, 9, and 10, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. See, the truth is sometimes as we're out ministering maybe we don't even see nobody in the street preach too. But yet, preach anyhow. That's right. Because there's principalities and powers. And as you stand up for God, and they see that, God gets to stick his tongue out at the devil. That's right. And say, see there, you see Tanya, what she's doing? You see the gospel track that Miss Luff's just handed out. Amen. You don't have to have people grandstanding. But the principalities and powers. And God gets all the glory. Amen. As you keep making all men see. Amen. What is that fellowship? So it's a sounding aloud. We can't keep it quiet. We got to tell everybody. It's good news. And then the fourth. It's a suffering fellowship. Now I, I hate to break your happiness but it's hurt sometimes in this fellowship it's hurt sometimes because it's like there's a place where Paul talks about this like God means for the church to have so much suffering and so since God can't find enough volunteers Paul said it's like Christ has let me catch up on all that suffering the church is supposed to have because nobody else wants to take it on and so it's very interesting doctrine in the Bible and Paul said it in this way in Philippians 1 4. Always and every prayer of mine, if you all make a request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. So we have this fellowship as we're working together, sending forth the gospel, taking this good news into the world that people might see the truth. And know the Lord the way we know the Lord. Amen. And so he talks here about his sufferings. And the bonds he goes through. And the afflictions. That seems like. He gets a lot of them. And maybe you have a lot of them. Some of us have a rougher road to hope. Some of us are sick more often than others. Here he says it in Philippians 2. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of joy, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Amen. We need to take on that suffering like Paul took it on and just take it on the chin for Jesus and keep going. Yeah, he couldn't hardly see. Yeah, his eyes bothered him. But he knew he asked God three times to take it away. And he wouldn't. He said, nope, my, you're my grace is sufficient. He said, yes, sir. It's like we read what King David said, Psalm 27. Yes, sir. Amen. It's all for the glory of God. Right. And then Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection mm -hmm. and the fellowship of his sufferings. When Christ was in this world, he didn't smile a lot. He was acquainted with grief and sorrow, the Bible says. He's a man of grief and sorrow. The fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Yes. Paul said, I die daily. And there's times we have to carry one another just like Sam had to carry Frodo. Right. It was too much a burden. He was, it was, it was too much a burden. 
plus he'd been stabbed on one occasion and man that thing hurt and he didn't know if he's gonna make it or not but they definitely knew that well there's a good chance we ain't never gonna go back home and see the Shire again and they were willing to make the sacrifice because they were on a mission and they knew they could count on one another as a fellowship Woo! we could really go there and have some fun <laughs> Then last but not least, we have a sunshine fellowship. Amen? Amen? Because in 1 John chapter 1, what does he say? What did John say? That one that laid on Jesus' bosom mm -hmm. as he watched Jesus hand out the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. And he said, one of you will betray me. Is it I? Is it I? Mm -hmm. Here's what he said in verse 3. Amen? 1 John Chapter 1, verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Right. Man, we've got a great fellowship. 1 John 5, 7. These three are one. Talking about the, the Father and the Word and the Holy Ghost. Amen? Right. Right. And man, we can have some great fellowship the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost had had some great fellowship. Jesus talked about it in John 17. Yes. And if we're walking in the light as He's in the light, man, we're having some great fellowship one with another. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what He says right here in verse 6. Amen? Mm -hmm. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. Praise the Lord. Jesus' blood is efficacious for everything. There's no such thing as an unpardonable sin. Right. When you know the Lord, it's all forgiven. That word means all. It means every word. Every yeah. sin. It's all covered by the blood. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Let's all stand by our heads in prayer. Father, help us to mm -hmm. take courage today that yes, we have a sweet fellowship with one another mm -hmm. because of the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that cleanses us from all sin. And just like we're all sinners and all deserve to go to hell, we're thankful that we can fellowship around Jesus' precious blood. That is what our common brotherhood is all about. Because we've been saved, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. In Jesus' name we thank you, Father, and amen. Alrighty.